Hello, my name is Zach Jenkins. I'm an associate professor of pharmacy practice and a clinical specialist in infectious diseases. COVID-19 has been with us for some time in the United States, and since then we've begun to learn how to best test for it, how to best control the spread of the infection, and really what things we should be looking for in patients that have the disease. However, there have been a number of emerging theories uh, regarding how the disease actually occurs in patients and the significance of that disease. And that's really causing us to question, were the therapies we've been using for our patients the most appropriate up front? We know that our typical patients with COVID-19 express a variety of characteristic symptoms, that being primarily fever and then cough being the first and second most common things we see. However, some patients are going to have shortness of breath in more severe cases, and then a variety of other symptoms. Most recently, we've discovered that some of our patients are expressing this new loss of taste and smell. Um, that's something we've seen domestically uh, since the virus has been with us in the United States, and that wasn't originally reported out of China. So we're continually gathering, gathering data and challenging the initial assumptions that we had. We know about 80% of all cases tend to be mild, and in those patients, the symptoms are really occurring as a result of your innate inflammatory response. So that response occurs because your immune system is trying to fight off the infection, so you'll develop a fever to actually burn off the virus. You'll actually cough to expel the virus and free up uh, the, the lung if you have any kind of fluid accumulation there. As fluid migrates, it, what it's doing is it's bringing white blood cells and antibodies to the site of, the, of an infection. And when that migration really happens, unfortunately, sometimes that fluid can accumulate in places and lead to symptoms like shortness of breath. Um, and then, then, of course, our goal is to generate white blood cells and antibodies. However, again, these things, while they're important to do, they can make patients uncomfortable as they start to develop symptoms. We know though that in about 20% of cases, uh, this will require some level of hospital management. 5% of all cases are going to require management in the intensive care unit. So why do some of these present, patients present with more severe disease? So when the virus is actually infecting an individual, we think one primary issue that some of these severe cases have run into is something called ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. And this results in impaired oxygen absorption. So what we do in these cases we use, is we use a ventilator to try to inflate the areas of the lung where that oxygen exchange really occurs to make sure oxygen adequately gets from the lungs into the blood. When we talk about other ways patients have presented, some of our patients have actually had in issues with oxygen delivery and the initial thought was this was caused by sepsis or shock where you had decreased blood flow to organs that resulted in organs shutting down. How we prevented and managed this is we would give things like fluids, we would give steroids, we would give medications that could help tighten down blood vessels and increase the pressure of blood flowing through your body. Uh, and so, so these things all together we were trying to manage with our, used to manage our patients up front. And the primary issues that we really saw in these cases, if you were to break this down, all this had to do with oxygen absorption problems and oxygen delivery problems. So as a reminder, um, what happens is your alveoli, your alveolus in your lungs, what, what happens in these situations is it's normally responsible for exchanging oxygen with your capillaries that flow, flow by your lungs. But what happens with the virus is it actually causes cell damage and then that cell damage trig triggers a white blood cell called a macrophage to release cytokines or messengers. Those messengers then trigger that immune response that we've just kind of talked about. Unfortunately, in some cases, if this immune response is very severe, you have what's called a cytokine storm occur. So there's so many cytokines circulating, you have an, a very severe immune response. And really what happens in these cases you, is you can have that sepsis that we've talked about occur. So that decreased blood flow as a result to sepsis via that shock. And then you can also have impaired oxygen exchange as that space between the, uh, the lung, specifically the alveoli of the lung, and the capillaries becomes clogged with fluid. So that's what we would normally expect to see in, in ARDS as well as with sepsis. So it's this idea of the cytokine storm that's occurring. However, there have been a number of things that have been recently popping up in the mass media media that have caused a lot to a lot of people to question what's going on. So this article highlights one such element. So uh, there was a report out of Italy where people were describing how ventilators were not quite as effective as they thought they should be, and in fact were maybe causing damage in some cases. If you think about those alveoli, kind of like a balloon that you inflate, if you inflate a balloon too much, of course it can pop. And the thought is that maybe if we're not dealing with ARDS in some of these cases, maybe inflating those, those alveoli is causing more harm than good.
And so according to this particular article, it talks about how experts are wondering if ventilators could be contributing to poor survival rate, maybe because we're kind of inflating things we shouldn't be inflating. Uh, maybe they're being overused. And they further state that when we use other things to supplement oxygen, like high flows, high flow nasal cannula where we're actually just running a, a tube with oxygen straight pushing straight into the body typically through the nose but it could be through a patient being intubated as well they, they found in these cases that uh, it's preventing doctors from maybe needing to use a ventilator in these situations so the thought is that the oxygen maybe is just as effective to give it through that mechanism as opposed to something that's assisting someone breathing there's another car article that really came out recently and what this described is that uh, we were starting to see younger patients that were having this cause of death attributable to heart attacks and strokes and they stated that some of these cases were occurring in patients under the age of 50. So this started to, to gain a lot of attention and cause a lot of alarm. And so there have been many, many articles published since then on this subject. Uh, but one particular article interviewed a team of radiologists who were actually researching this particular disease progression. And what they found is that uh, according to their data, COVID-19 seemed to be more than just that lung infection, more than just that, that ARDS process that we've talked about. They actually think that it's causing a hypercoagulable state, meaning you're more likely to have blood clots. You're more likely to have a thrombosis, which is really just a fancy word for blood clots. That, that occurs and results in life-threatening illness. And so they think that maybe you could circumvent that by using better anticoagulation, better blood thinning strategies in some of these patients. So if we kind of add those new theories to what we know before, and you were to break them up in a similar way, oxygen absorption would have been primarily through ARDS. But what we were starting to see is absorption didn't seem to be the biggest issue because patients weren't presenting in the same way that you would normally expect in that pattern. So, so typically we, what we were seeing were issues more with oxygen circulating in the blood. Uh, and so part of that they thought could be due to sepsis. But then there's, there's these new thoughts that maybe we're actually causing occlusions of blood flow through very, very, very small blood clots that form. And then possibly through this idea that maybe we're attacking red blood cells uh, and, and hemoglobin may be associated with that. Speaking specifically to hemoglobin. This article highlights something that came out at the beginning of April, and they think that COVID-19 could attack hemoglobin, which is a part of red blood cells that are responsible for carrying oxygen. And basically, the thought here is you decrease that transport of oxygen throughout the body. So if we focus on hemoglobin for a second, hemoglobin, as I mentioned, is a part of your red blood cells, and that helps you carry oxygen. So when oxygen is actually exchanged from your lungs into your blood, it ends up being attached to hemoglobin. And so it attaches usually on one of four different domains on that hemoglobin molecule. But the, the rising thought is that maybe COVID-19 would attack one of those four sites of the hemoglobin molecule, and that could actually decrease its overall oxygen carrying capacity. So that could explain some of these initial reports that, that were describing how people were, were mirroring almost like what you see when you have altitude sickness and you have trouble exchanging oxygen in that environment. Uh, it's a very similar kind of effect where hemoglobin has trouble carrying oxygen. So they thought maybe this could be a mechanism behind what's occurring. However, there, there's been some more data that's come out recently regarding COVID-19 and possibility of blood clots. And, and so one article talks about COVID-19 and how it's associated with an enzyme called ACE2. So according to the article, um, we, we've known from the beginning that SARS-CoV-2 uh, actually ends up being associated with a receptor that binds this enzyme, this ACE2. And the thought is when you actually block that receptor, it puts a patient at potentially a higher risk of COVID-19. What's interesting is apparently COVID-19 needs this receptor to try to enter cells. And so this is starting to become a drug target or, or a vaccine target down the road. But a quick review of how our blood vessels are kind of structured. Uh, you see here in this diagram that we have several different layers to every blood vessel. And specifically the layer I want to focus on is the endothelium. So this is the inner lining of the red blood cell and it has these small cells there. And so this is going to play an important role when we talk about the possibility of clots associated with this whole ACE2 process. This image here highlights actually a cross section of a blood vessel that's been plated and, and being looked at under a microscope. And you can kind of see here that you, you can uh, imagine what the endothelial lining actually looks like in practice. So we think this endothelial lining is really important in this process, as you'll see here in just a moment. So what I've done here is I've tried to actually map out 
uh, my, my interpretation of a blood vessel here on, on the right side of this image. And then we have COVID-19 entering patients. So the thought is we, we've got the cytokine storm that occurs, all these cell signalers that, that are, these inflammatory signalers that are causing this massive inflammatory overload. So we think that what happens is it generates oxidative stress, which leads to the creation of reactive particles. So really all you need to know there is that you have reactive particles, things that are highly charged and can cause damage that, that are created. The other thing that we know is because it blocks this ACE2 enzyme, because that's again the place where it needs to actually enter into a cell from, it causes further stress because as we'll learn, this ACE, as we've learned, this ACE2 enzyme is responsible for producing a substance that helps to decrease those reactive particles that are floating around. And those reactive particles are very important to think about because they end up uh, being able to bind to things and cause lots and lots of damage. So as those particles accumulate, what ends up happening in cases is this endothelial lining becomes damaged. So this inner lining of the red blood cell, or of a blood vessel, I'm sorry, becomes damaged by these reactive particles. And that ultimately triggers a clot to form. So we already have inflammation occurring because of the cytokine storm associated with sepsis in a lot of cases. We're blocking this enzyme, leading to more of these reactive particles that build up. And we know these things can potentially cause damage to the inner lining of your blood vessels, triggering that clot. So that's our overall thought here. And, and as a result, we have a decrease in blood flow. So where does that leave us right now? So these things are just theories, as I mentioned, but it's causing a lot of medical associations and uh, and clinicians really to question how should we best manage our patients. And so there have been a number of articles published describing some of that, that uh, process that I've just mentioned, but more recently there have been some guidelines talking about maybe we should think about more aggressive strategies when it comes to thinning the blood to hopefully decrease the possibility of those clots. So that's it for this week's discussion on emerging theories. As you can see, uh, we're starting to learn more about this virus and we're still not quite sure how everything works. So it's important to recognize I say theory here because these things still need to be vetted out through appropriate research that is peer reviewed. Thank you for your time.